shop's a mess as always, but I thought I'd show you guys kind of what it looks like to, we just finished the redraft on a customer pattern, um, had a couple of tweaks to make. We ended up with about seven and five eighths inch leg opening at the ankle. And he was hoping for a true seven inch, really like a skinny taper, uh, kind of low rise style jean. And so got the rise right, got the thigh fit perfectly below the knee, wasn't stoked, wanted something a little slimmer. Um, so finished our fitting, got the pattern redrafted. I'm gonna start pulling some denim. He selected uh, some dead stock white oak. Um, some really beautiful white oak selvage. Um, pretty traditional style. It's got the uh, the red line selvage ID. So this was this was probably something that was manufactured. It could have been for Levi's, could have been for Lee. Um, I, who knows? But it's a it's a beautiful dead stock denim. Um, there's a really good chance that this denim passed through. Uh, Billiam Jeans shop. We we purchased some small pieces of denim from him a few years ago. Um, Bill has been really kind to us over the years to help support us with sourcing machines and um, getting denim. Uh, once it gets down to small enough quantities that he can't use it for size runs, we'll use it for custom little projects like this uh, for one-off garments. But I'm gonna iron this flat, lay it out on the table, start tracing, show you guys how we lay out a pattern. Right. Since we're using a narrow loom selvage denim, we got to be really careful about how we lay out our pattern. There's quite a few pieces that go into a pair of jeans. And so, ideally, we got to be really thoughtful about our yield. I like to do it on the fold, so I actually I actually fold the denim this way. It's the easiest way that I can get a waistband out of it. I don't like to cut waistbands on the selvage if I can avoid it, because it just makes a big portion of the denim unusable for the actual regular block of the pant. So we're gonna give these an extra inch on the hemline. Wax Taylor's chalk, that's what I prefer on denim. Typically I like to trace on the wrong side of the fabric, but with denim, it's really hard to see chalk against that side. So it all gets hidden in the seam allowance anyways. So with this stuff, we're gonna trace it right onto the face of the fabric. And I'm just making adjustments right on the pit, on the fabric here. I knew that we needed to add a little bit to the out seam on this pattern. So we just need an extra inch on there to accommodate our hem. And I forgot to draw it on the paper. So I've got notes on this pattern to extend it a little bit down here. I like to use a nice sharp brand new chalk when I'm doing full pattern cuts like this. And I've laid this pattern out on this type of denim with this amount so many times that I'm not, I'm not taking time to pre-plot where everything is gonna go because I already kind of know how that's gonna lay out. Otherwise, I would check all this first and make sure that we're getting the maximum yield out of the fabric with the least amount of waste possible. But I've already done that. I know how it's gonna lay out. So I'm just going for it. I like to set aside pieces as I finish tracing with them. And anything that's not getting cut out of denim, like our pocket lining, our pocket bag, anything that's getting cut out of our pocket bag material or an alternate material to what you're making, I always try to keep that set aside because the last thing you want to do, especially with this dead stock, this is the last of this denim of its kind. It's never going to get produced again. It's done. So I want to make sure 
that we're being really careful about how we use it, really intentional about our yield. I'm not lining up the top layer and the bottom layer of fabric yet. I'm gonna do that when it's actually time to cut. A lot of times your selvage lines won't line up perfectly. The fabric will have some imperfection to it. It might be stretched a little bit on one side. Just from handling, just from years of sitting in a factory basement or, you know, this stuff. Like I said, there, I think it probably came out of Bill's shop. So it's it's been through multiple hands. It's been stored and taken out and stored and taken out so many times who knows how many times i've touched it or he touched it who knows what it went through when it was still at white oak so i'll line all that stuff up when it comes time to cut For our big pattern blocks for the actual main part of the pants, I like to use these big flat cast iron pattern weights. For stuff like this that I can spread my hand over pretty well, I'll just kind of hold it in place, make sure it doesn't shift while I'm tracing. You always want to label your pattern pieces. This is a cut one, this is a cut one, this is cut two, cut two, obviously cut two. So you want to make sure this stuff's labeled or you are really familiar with it. Right now, this is a cut one piece for the fly guard. So on the other side of this, I'm not going to cut two of those out. On the other side, I'm going to trace this piece right here. Actually, I gotta retrace this one because this one's supposed to land on the selvage. Except on that side. <laughs> so it's gotta, I gotta retrace it on this side. And this is just to create a little Easter egg so we end up with a piece of selvage poking through on the inside of the jeans. So this will be visible on the fly guard when it's installed on the inside of the jeans. Not necessary, but it's kind of cool. I find that people get really stoked on it when they find little places where there's some selvage peeking through that wouldn't normally be there. Like right here, we'll leave a little selvage on the, uh, on this fly piece. And anytime you're retracing over something that you already traced, Make sure you make a mental note about which one you actually want to cut and which one you're not supposed to cut. Otherwise, you end up just wasting fabric. If you're trying to cut fabric like this at home, 
and you don't have an electric cutter, you're using heavyweight material like this, and you're just using scissors, it's probably a good idea not to fold your fabric and cut it once at a time. So you'll trace it twice. So this would actually be laid out flat and you'll trace everything as a duplicate on this side. I can't, I can't take the time to do that. So I like to do it this way. And I like to use our electric fabric cutter. We've got a four inch electric rotary cutter, which we're about to fire up and sharpen and get to cutting on this. I'm just gonna go ahead and do this right now. We'll just let it run, man. Power cord, that's important. You gotta find a power cord. You gotta find an extension cord. Um, if you're not running a business out of an old ballet studio, then you would uh, you'd probably have an overhead power track for something like this. But this is a dance studio and we have three power outlets in the whole building. So we gotta kind of make do. We run a lot of drop cords. Uh, Fire Marshal doesn't love it. Neither do anybody having a walk through here. It's a trip hazard constantly. But it works, you know? It is what it is. Okay. So now this is where I'm actually going to start lining up my selvage, making sure that our fabric's lined up so that I'm getting really clean cuts. Everything's coming out even and symmetrical. And this whole empty section here that we didn't utilize, you see I used it at the top of the fabric. That's because I'm going to cut waistband and I'm going to cut belt loops out of right here. So you can yield, you can use this piece of fabric, you can actually use it really, really thoughtfully and really effectively, especially if you've only got enough fabric to get up to here. You can couch some of this stuff in here. You got to be careful about losing waistband, but a lot of times you can figure out a way to find some waistband material in this. I like to cut waistbands on the grain line. Some people will cut them this way and create two-piece waistbands. Selvage isn't usually wide enough to do that. But we don't we tell people not to wash our denims tell them to treat it just like a raw denim soak it wear it as often as possible i'll usually wear a pair of jeans 30 40 sometimes 60 days in between washes in the summertime i'll i'll do a lot more laundering but typically you don't want to wash it but just in case denim shrinks vertically but it tends to have a little more movement on the grain as well um or actually it'll, it'll stay nice and static on the grain and it'll move a little more against the grain. But for waistbands, I want it to hold its shape pretty well.
a lot of people call this part a coin pocket. It's actually not a coin pocket. It's called a watch pocket. Before, before wristwatches were invented, a lot of a lot of people, especially that had a need to wear jeans, people that were working in the mining industry, people that were working on railroads, uh, doing cattle ranching out west, they would still need to carry a watch, which by default would be a pocket watch, but they wouldn't have need or really by just by nature of their trade, they wouldn't be able to wear things like waistcoats. They might not have some of the finer clothing trappings, but they would have still needed a place to put that pocket watch, if not having a waistcoat where they would have a pocket here. So the original fifth pocket on jeans, it was for your pocket watch, not for, not for pocket change. A little denim trivia. All right, so we cut the one side. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this selvage towards me on this side so we can make sure that our fabric is nice and even. So you can actually see, maybe you can see, there's about a quarter inch, maybe three eighths of an inch difference where the fabric has drifted. So this top layer of fabric, it was stretched a little more than what was underneath. So I'll kind of fluff it out here. Make sure you don't lose your crease for your hemline is going to be otherwise you're going to end up having different size pants tuck under there all right so we got these lined up looks pretty good pretty clean i'll wait the center there i just want to prevent that fabric from drifting any while i'm cutting Don't put your fingers in front of the blade. If you're running a rotary cutter, manual or electric, don't do it. I've cut the tip of this finger off, cut the tip of that finger off. It's not good. So I'm really, really careful. I do put my hand in front of the blade, but I've got a guard on there and I try to be really careful when I'm doing it. You gotta pay attention. I had a buddy in here trying on a pair of jeans when I cut the tip of my index finger off. He was standing back there trying to pair on and he said something and I was going to make a cut and I turned my head and that blade glanced up over my cutting guide and tip of the finger came right off. Not too big a deal. I got a buddy that's a doctor and he said it was all right. So.
Now we gotta cut the waistband. So not a lot of waste left over. I mean, we've got this nice big piece of fabric, but I can cut multiple waistbands out of this. We have enough of this fabric to make. This might be the last of it, but I think we've got another set that we can make another pair of jeans out of. So not too much waste. This can be two waistbands and probably about 28 belt loops. I don't cut our waistbands with the electric cutter because I can't get a straight line that's 22 inches long like that. I can't get it as well as I'd like it to be. And with the waistband, since it's going through a folder on our machine, we use a Singer 302 waistband installing machine. Um, it's, a, it's a vintage machine, but it's got a really cool folder on it and it actually folds the waistband. So what I like to do is I cut it with a ruler and a rotary cutter, a manual rotary cutter. This is the one that took the tip of my finger off. So don't think just because they're not electric, they're not dangerous. This thing's got a, I think a 45 millimeter or 60 millimeter blade on it. And it'll jump that ruler and take that finger right off if you're not careful. So I always make sure I'm squared up against something where I can create a perfect right angle. Make sure that I'm nice and square. And then I got cut that. That's not enough for belt loops, so we'll discard that part. And I'll square off this edge now. Take this top off, because we don't need that part. Actually, first I'll go ahead and cut this waistband. Waistbands, we cut them four and one eighth inch wide. That's what our folder calls for. And it's pretty standard in the industry. You don't, you don't see waistbands sized differently than that very often. Unless you're using a two-piece waistband folder, then you're probably cutting, I don't know, something like two and a half, two and three quarters on each side. And it'll fold it in on both sides for you. Boom. It's a waistband, it's absurdly long right now. Um, here, I gotta square this up a little bit. There's a notch right there that I don't want when I'm putting it through the folder, that's gonna give me trouble. So, trim that away, boom. Done with that. I am just gonna cut this off. And now, I've got a perfect straight line I make belt loops out of one inch. So what we'll do, we'll do a couple lines of belt loops. Boom, that'll run through our belt loop machine. Make enough belt loops for this pair of jeans. I'm gonna cut another waistband here. Band. Let's get a couple sets of belt loops out of this. Boom. Now, we've got all the pieces we need to make a pair of jeans. We'll grab a zipper out of the zipper bin, and start ironing this stuff into shape, and uh, hopefully tomorrow afternoon we'll put these in the mail to a guy down in Atlanta, a bike shop owner down there that also actually makes bags. Um, he does some really cool stuff. He owns a shop called The Spindle in Atlanta. That if you live in the area, go check him out. Ez is a great guy. They've got a great little shop. Give a shout. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down and sew these.